Let's say someone asked you, what is magic? Your answer would likely include the word game. You wouldn't need to mention creature combat or counter spells. Already, your friend would know what you're talking about. That's because everyone has played games in some form or another. And yet, it's hard to actually define game. Maybe it's something you do for fun. That's too broad. I cook for fun. That's not a game. Or maybe games are, um, uh, a physical or mental competition conducted according to rules with the participants in direct opposition to each other. That's too specific. That leaves out co-op games and single-player games. On this episode, we're looking at play research. Our goal is to find an academic definition of play. We'll think about how play scholars would have classified magic. Just as importantly, we'll update those definitions with the help of a modern play researcher. It's time to search your library. Plenty of historical minds have commented on play. Both Plato and Confucius, for example, observed that children learn better when they play games. But they didn't really try to define play. Like us, maybe they assumed that everyone already knew what it meant. For the first rigorous definition, we turn to Dutch historian Johan Huizinga. Huizinga's 1938 book Homo Ludens is considered a foundational work in ludology, or play studies. Homo ludens means man the player, because Huizinga's thesis is that elements of games define human culture. Across its 12 chapters, Huizinga describes how war, riddles, elections, and music are all variations of play. But the most influential chapter of Homo ludens is the first one, Nature and Significance of Play as a Cultural Phenomenon. In it, Huizinga isolates characteristics of games. They overlap a fair bit, so I like to boil them down. Play is an activity that satisfies the following. First, play is freedom. It is a voluntary activity. You can stop playing without a physical or moral cost because it is outside reality. Second, play is order. In place of reality, games have their own rules. These rules redefine how we interact with each other and the world of the game. If you break these rules, you're a spoil sport, you ruin the game. Third, play does not relate to material interest. When you finish playing, it shouldn't affect you in the real world. These properties create a very broad definition of play. Let's go through them and see if magic fits Huizinga's definition. Magic is definitely outside normal reality. You're pretending to be wizards attacking each other with magical spells. Coincidentally, Huizinga's definition is often referred to as the magic circle. Also, magic definitely has its own rules. There are, of course, over 800 in Magic's comprehensive rulebook, but even new players quickly learn the basics of interaction. For example, you can only attack each other once on your turn. But this is where Huizinga's definition breaks down a bit. For most players, magic is definitely a leisure activity. But like many games, it can also include obligations that affect you after the game ends. When you play a game of magic, it's generally frowned upon to leave halfway. At higher levels, professionals have careers that depend on play. Huizinga would have considered this a corruption of play, like gambling. So overall, Huizinga's definition is… fine. For a more developed one, we turn to Roger Kaiwa. French sociologist Roger Kaiwa is also considered a founder of ludology. His 1961 book, Man, Play, and Games, critiques and extends Huizinga's definition in some key ways. First, Kaiwa clarified that games do not create value. However, outcomes could still be tied to them. Kaiwa therefore includes activities like gambling. Second, Kaiwa added the idea that games involve some amount of uncertainty. This could be through hidden information or random chance. This is definitely true in a game of magic. If you knew the outcome at the start, it's not a game. From here, ludology began to take off, with research expanding beyond definition. 
Sociologists like Brian Sutton Smith focused on the importance of play in evolution and development. Narratologists like Janet Murray understand games in terms of their narrative structures. Perhaps we'll cover some of these fields in later episodes. For now, I'd like to get back to that definition because there's something I didn't mention. Homo ludens and man playing games are very dated, literally because they're half a century old, but also figuratively. They're written for white audiences of their time and contain racist descriptions of non white cultures, including mine. Because of those biases, I think it's important to re examine these definitions. To do so, we'll need the help of an expert. My name is Aaron Tremell. I am an assistant professor of informatics and visual studies at UC Irvine, and I am editor in chief of analog game studies. Dr. Tremell's research is about the history of hobby gaming. He's recently published a paper that critiques some of Hoisinger's theories, and as you'll find out, he's been playing magic since the very beginning. So, we're talking today about the historical definitions of play and games that are out there. Are Hoisinger, Kaiwa, and their theories? Still widely accepted in the field? Oh, yeah. I, so I think that those are both really common readings of how play works from some folks who have been really historic in the field, and they're, they've been widely disseminated. There's some pushback against the individuals themselves, right? So, like, Kaiwa and Huizinga are writing from mostly European perspective. Kaiwa, in particular, invokes terms like barbarism and civilization frequently, so does Hoisinger, right? And these are like historically racist terms. So there's been some pushback about the degree to which we ought to take on their thinking about play whole hog in the field recently. But often that doesn't rise to the level of actually critiquing the theory. Often the person is critiqued and the theory isn't. So do these definitions end up being used in modern play research? For example, do people still refer to play as freedom? But there's another word that gets used with play that I, I like to think about voluntarism, right? Like play is a voluntary act. It's not a coercive act. These are the things that get attached to the spirit of play. And for sure, this messaging around voluntarism and freedom tends to be a key part of a lot of game study scholarship. You could say in game studies that these ideals kind of define the moment of play, right? You get whole schools of scholarship saying play and learning should work together. Why should play and learning work together? Well, because play is a way to bring kids into this exercise of learning. It gives them free agency over these things. It's a safe way for them to explore things. And so it, it's been a really important and relevant thing for the field for a long time, especially with social scientists working in the field. I noticed you said earlier that these theories were not often critiqued. Would you modify some of those properties of play? This idea that play is freedom, I, I don't totally buy it. Let's think back on some histories of the black experience in North America. There's an old slave game that was played, and it's called Hide the Switch. And in Hide the Switch, kids, black kids, would, would basically hide a switch in the yard somewhere and if you were the one who was able to find the switch right you were able to then abuse the other children with this toy right so here's this moment of play that's really brutal it's really upsetting it's really ugly to think about right and it, it makes me wonder the degree to which play is always voluntary because for sure if you opt into that game or if you're playing that game do you actually want to get abused by the switch I, i'm not so sure that anybody does. And I'm not so sure that at that moment, we are talking about voluntarism, right? Like there's been a contract that's been entered into, but I don't know if that's voluntary. So maybe my question becomes, what is play instead of freedom? I think when we think about games and examples of games like that, we might be able to come up with a different phenomenology of play. One that helps us to understand maybe that play is a more violent concept sometimes than we might want to acknowledge, right? When I think about spaces of play online, spaces of abuse online, spaces of abuse online that people call play that are really abusive to other people, I actually think it's a non-voluntary relationship where one person decides, hey, you're going to play with me. 
and the other person, whether they like it or not, is kind of subject to the whims of what they call play and how they can rhetorically wield that term. Right, and in these situations, it's often hard for the victim to leave because of the social pressures of the game. Huizinga has a word for that because he's written a lot about that, right? It, when you leave that friend group, right, you become the spoil sport because you leave that contract of play. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of critical theorist Sarah Ahmed, but she talks about the spoil sport and the killjoy as these sort of like feminist figures, these, these figures that might be recuperating something important when they spoil the sport, right? So Sarah Ahmed says that the killjoy is important because even though the killjoy might be killing everybody's joy in the room, they're speaking truth in a way. And so the, the example she uses when she writes about it is, you know, the queer child in a family who says, I'm not going to opt into these like sort of hetero patriarchal words that my family's slinging around at the dinner table. I'm going to say, hey, that's wrong. That's messed up. That's racist. Right. Like that person just killed the joy of everybody at the table. But at the same time, they're doing the right thing by killing that joy and they are making an important point. Let's turn now to Magic the Gathering specifically. Are there any properties of play that magic breaks? I don't think it breaks any definitions. I think a definition is hard to break, right? Like a definition is only as useful as you find it useful. I'm going to talk about my very favorite magic mechanic ever, which is the most taboo magic mechanic ever, because I think that it speaks to some of these definitions of play that we we're, we were talking about, and that's the ante. So when revised edition, when I was a kid, and revised edition and Magic the Gathering was out, you would cut a card from your deck at random before the game started, and that would be the ante. And whoever won the game would win both cards from both decks. So it was this kind of way that Richard Garfield, when he had initially designed the game, saw the cards moving through the community. It was a way that you couldn't have predictable decks that always had the same exact set of cards in them, because he didn't think that there would be a market. He didn't think the game would be that big. So Black Lotus becomes a fair card then because it's moving around your group of friends. Yeah. We never had a Black Lotus in my friend group. I wish we did. I, I was always like, oh man, that card costs $100, which is probably not the price it costs anymore. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so with the ante, I thought this was really interesting, right? Because that was a taboo of play. Poising, I didn't want play to be gambling. He wanted it to be the sort of like positive structure that was always generative and again he really avoided talking about play in the sense of gambling because he thought that invoking these taboos would show that the games that people play weren't necessarily positive they weren't necessarily constructive and so one of the the most fascinating mechanics of magic the gathering for me was the ante because that was this moment right where the, in this game suddenly we're leaving the realm of we're leaving the realm of the magic circle and we're, we're moving into property in real life and the exchange of property in real life and the exchange of valued property in real life. So why was anti dropped? Because it is so taboo. It is breaking this sort of illusion. The magic circle is debated in a lot of ways. I would just call it an illusion. Like, so it's, it's a useful way to understand some social contract that happens around place sometimes. But I, I do think that the anti busts right through that and really just reveals what's really at stake in a game of magic. And also, right, like, keep in mind, all the value that we put into all these cards is socially constructed on some level. So Richard wasn't crazy when he's thinking, like, you shuffle a thing and you pull a card out for the ante, even if it's a Black Lotus. It's a piece of cardboard, a thin piece of cardboard that only has value because of this sort of, like, history behind it. And all the buy-in that we have into this myth, the magic of magic. Okay, let's summarize. Based on historical theory, play is an activity that is freedom from reality, has rules that redefine reality, does not create or destroy value, and has uncertainty to create competition. But as Dr. Trammell suggested, these are an illusion we enter into. Games are an attempt to make this definition true. 
play isn't actually outside reality. A game's rules reflect the values and biases of the real world. We put value into games, whether explicitly, like with an ante, or implicitly with the value we ascribe to winning. And finally, it's good to spoil play in competition when play doesn't feel like freedom. The next time you play Magic, ask yourself some questions. In which ways have you stepped out of reality? On the other hand, how do the rules of Magic feel connected to the real world? Do you feel more free as you play? And if so, is that what makes Magic fun? Thank you for listening to this episode of Search Your Library. If you have the time, please like, comment, subscribe, tweet, share, or mention me during a Zoom call. If you'd like to reach me directly, you can find me on Twitter at at Guyon. I'd like to thank Dr. Trammell for his insights this episode. If you're interested in hearing more from him, I've posted a much less edited version of our interview here. If you want to know more about his work, you can find him at at Aaron Tram or analoggamestudies.org. That's all for now. Until next episode, keep learning, keep playing, and keep seven. Shh.